guys, welcome, welcome to Interstage Window, my stream on Saturdays, which is a conversation with my friend Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon, and we're coming to you high quality with a microphone. <laughs> what is this? Oh my gosh, yeah, so Landon <laughs> should sound um, even more beautiful this we're, week than she normally does. <laughs> we're slowly moving up in the world, uh, slowly but surely we're getting there. That's right. That's right. Um, speaking of which, hey, Brie, speaking of which, before we actually get started on the topic today, I just want to show you guys. Boom. Landon actually has a socials command now, so you can see all of the different places to find Landon. Um, so so if you're you're a Landon fan here, then here's all the things. See her Instagram, her TikTok, her Twitter, and her Amazon wish list. <laughs> I'm official bitches. You can't get rid of me now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right all I right have the social <laughs> okay okay so i know um you know we risk running over on these on these media episodes just like we did with harry potter so let's get started okay let's show yeah. everybody our beautiful presentation here we go shadow and bone all right so landon what are we gonna what are we gonna be talking about today explain it to everybody well we're gonna be talking about the hit netflix show shadow and bone mentioning a little bit about the series uh named after the same the same name as well as the series six of crows uh so there will be spoilers mm -hmm. uh we just wanted to let you know that this is not a spoiler free stream uh we will be talking about all of lee Bergerdo, Ber berdugo's oh my gosh i cannot pronounce her name I think it's Verdugo's. Uh, I think you, the second what you said it is yeah. right. Okay. Lee Verdugo's <laughs> uh, novel, Shadow and Bone, and his Six of Crows series, as well as the spoilers for the TV series, which is different from the books. So mm -hmm. make sure that you are caught up on all of the things if you do not want to be spoiled. Uh, and if you do want to be spoiled or you do want to participate in this in this conversation, let's let's keep going. Yeah. We believe here that spoilers don't actually make um, reading or watching something lesser. So spoilers are okay. We're okay with them. I definitely spoiled myself on the books because I only watched the TV show and then then basically read synopsises of the books. So I major spoilered myself. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, to be honest, from everything that I have heard, uh, the Shadow and Bone TV show is better than the Shadow and Bone books. But mm -hmm. Six of Crows books don't have anything to do with the TV show other than having characters in them. So that's right. That's fine. Too. That's right. Uh, on that... <laughs> I'm watching this to force myself to like the series. It's actually, it's a really good TV series, but we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Um, we do want to warn our audience to say that there will be discussion of racism, sexism, and possible mentions of dubious consent uh, in today's stream. If you don't like that, we understand. And we ask yourself, we ask you to show yourself out now because we want to talk about the implications that really are brought up in the TV show as well as the novels. That's right. Yep. No hard feelings if you have to close the stream or close the Absolutely VOD. It's okay. Not. Your your yucks and our yums can be different things. <laughs> that's right. Okay, so that's all oh. the warnings. Let's actually get into the content, right? Okay, welcome. With, before we do that, we have to start with our favorite things. So Karen, what was your favorite thing about Shadow and Bone? Okay, so if you're paying attention to my background, you probably can already guess. You can see I drew a little, I drew, I drew a little heart right here. Um, so yeah, Landon, click it, tell, show them. My favorite thing is Dark Lena. Oh my <laughs> God, y'all. Oh my God, I am such a sucker for this kind of shenanigans. Okay, it's like literally ball of light shipped with literal darkness. I, I can't, I can't hold myself back. We love I can't, you know. Of tracks. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't pretend. I can't pretend. This is my jam. This my shit. Okay. I'm here for it. I, I love Dark Lena. Um, it's the best. I don't have any, I don't have any, um, you know, illusions that Dark Lena is ever going to be canon. That's okay. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. You know, the canon doesn't have to stretch hundreds of years into the future. I know what ends up eventually happening. Okay. I'm also, good with I it. I would just like to say, <laughs> given that screenshot, it is in fact canon. It's just maybe not endgame. 
It's not in game. You're right. It's not in game. But there's canon. there's a section. <laughs> there there's there's like there's a there's a part where like of the story where like that's the couple. You know, that's the couple, yeah. and that's what's happening. It just that should, it doesn't end up that way. <laughs> that should be the couple period of the story. Also, it doesn't hurt that Ben Barnes is a one sexy motherfucker. <laughs> you know what? Okay, so this is the thing when we were watching it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I was watching it, and I didn't really know much about Shadow and Bone, except for the fact that it was a popular YA series, right? Like, that's all I knew. And it was the new Netflix thing. And so we were watching it, right? And, um, you know, we were talking about various things. And just the fact that the character was played by Ben Barnes, we knew everything that was going to happen. <laughs> Like, I know, I'm like, he's going to be the villain. There's going to be, you know, some some villain hero romance, right? And that's going to be, that's going to be his role in the show. And that's exactly what happens. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Um, you know, it's it's definitely uh, not highbrow, but uh, we don't care because it's fun. <laughs> did, did we ever want highbrow to begin with? No. Okay, so that's <laughs> the thing about this show. This is what you have to understand. And Dark Lena, I think, really fits into this. This is a this is a CW show on Netflix. Okay, it has a CW cast. It has a CW color palette. It has a CW plot. Like this is. Oh my god! It does have a CW color palette. Yeah, <laughs> it's it does. Yes, like they they literally were like, you know, all those CW shows that get popular, like let's talk about early Arrowverse, let's talk about, you know, um, Vampire Diaries, let's talk about Supernatural, yeah. like what makes those popular? Okay, we're going to do that. Like that's what this show, that's what this show did, except it elevated it. We're going to talk about that later. That gets away from the yeah, Darkly. Yeah, and they did it successfully. Yeah. Like that's the mm -hmm. other thing too, is they did it successfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to get to that. But first, before that, Landa, what was your favorite thing? I mean, let's just talk about tall blonde and daddy issues for a second. Mm. Uh, the amazing, aloof, and incredibly too smart for his own brain, Kaz, uh, who is it was one of the characters from the novel Six of Crows and makes an appearance in Shadow and Bone uh, as basically the leader of a heist type gang of uh con con men and yeah. running a casino and just being everything cool that i ever wanted to be in life <laughs> <laughs> we do love to stan um our our capitalist twink daddies here and kaz we fits that bill really do he <laughs> oh my god that is the branding mm -hmm. um <laughs> He's just, he's incredibly smart. He's incredibly witty, brooding, sarcastic. I i honestly don't know what there is not to love about him. He's trying to survive in a world in which money is power. And he doesn't necessarily want power, but he wants to be able to do whatever he wants to do, which means he needs money. That's right. That's right. Uh, Kaz wants to live. Kaz wants to live comfortable and take care of his people. And, and this is, this is the way, what he sees is the way to do it. Yes. And he is incredibly smart and clever and just sardonic. Think of the, you know, the British humor, very Sherlockian type with maybe a little bit more of a heart. Mm -hmm. um, and overall, just just greatly written as being the grumpy old man of the group, but also... But he's not even old. Like, he's very young in this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> But he he's is. a grumpy old he man. He's incredibly young, but he, you know there are just those people with a, as a grumpy old man who has, like, a personality. He is mm -hmm. he is the grumpy old man. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's fantastic. And I have to say, if the starting screen was any indication for those of you guys that, um, that got to the stream before we actually started talking, uh, the best part... Dark Lena aside, which I love as a ship, but the best part of Shadow and Bone really is the crows, and it really is Kaz and his friends. Um, that's the best part of the show. It that whole that section, every part that's their storyline, is the best scenes, um, the best plots, the best lines. I mean, it's it's everything. It is all the things. Uh, Bree, just to tell you right now, we're talking uh, newish CW, more of the Arrow originals, Vampire Diary yeah, I'm, type, I'm not One like, Tree Hill. Like 2010s. I'm talking about like 2010 CW. Yeah, the, 20, right? the 2010s. Yeah, 2010 so, CW. So if you liked 2010 right. CW, watch Shadow and Bone. You will like it. <laughs> Which also makes sense because the stories were originally published in the in the early 2010s as well. I think the That's first. Right. I think the first book comes out in 2012. That sounds about right. So it makes sense. All right, shall we dick deep 
dig deep into this. Uh, we know what Landon's into thinking what about right means. now since we honestly, were just talking about Kaz. <laughs> just honestly, the Freudian slip right there. All right, um, let's talk about Netflix. Speaking of okay. dicks. Okay, so, so, before, so before we get into that, um, I, I want to kind of make the point here because we, we talked a little bit about the state of the publishing industry last time we talked about Harry Potter, right? So this time we want to talk about Netflix because um, you've, you've probably heard the phrase before, the medium is the message, right? So the medium is mm-hmm. the best message, which means choosing to cre- make something a TV show versus a movie versus a book versus a painting versus, you know, whatever it is, you are bound by the conventions of that medium. And Netflix, well, I think what we're going to get into with this, I, I want to argue that Netflix has created its own medium. A Netflix TV show is not the same as other TV shows. So um, nope. so that being that being said, um, Landon, if you could kind of explain to us a little bit about the, the concept of the Netflix original. Yeah, so the next the Netflix original uh, comes from the fact that wh- how Netflix started, of course, uh, just for a brief history of those who don't who remember, uh, Netflix was basically an online version of Blockbuster. You can ask to rent a movie. Uh, it was all done over the internet, though. They would send it in the mail, and two to three days later, you would get a DVD. You'd watch it, and then you'd return it. Getting those little Never red envelopes was like the most fun thing ever, by the way, back <laughs> in that, really, at that time. <laughs> it really was. And it was also then you didn't have to deal with Blockbuster and and you could like plan date nights and it was great. Yeah. It was it was really great. You leaving and the then, house, who wants to do that? <laughs> in the in the days of 2021, that has an entirely new meeting. <laughs> um but no, no one wants to leave their house ever. Uh <laughs> and then we arrive um to when Netflix opened up as streaming. And so this originally started with the movies that they had in their collection. So Netflix was paying a huge amount of fees to production companies like Warner Brothers to be able to stream movies like Harry Potter available online. That way you didn't have to order Harry Potter through them. You could go onto your computer or your laptop and just stream it. And that's how it started. Netflix was really the first of its kind to do this. This was before the days of on demand really like took off. This was like when TiVo was a big thing where you recorded mm-hmm, things mm-hmm. on 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 TV yep. that played and, and then watched them later. And Netflix basically saw what some of those early on demand services were doing and figured it out and they were the first ones to do this successfully. So yes. it's not like the first first to to do it, but the first to do it and actually make it a viable um, business that was popular. Well, and how they did that is that they charged a subscription rate. There was a lot yeah. of things very much like modern day Amazon Prime where you could buy an online movie and pay $14 for it. Or you can charge $11 a month to Netflix and watch all of these movies. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And it was a library of movies that you were able to just instantly watch and have access to. And it was one set price and that was it. Yep. But here's, here's the thing that happened. Like, okay, so for you, y'all that don't know, um, my job in college, there, most of the time that I was in college, uh, I was, it was at Blockbuster. So I'm very familiar with that, with that business. And, um, the whole reason that movie rentals became even a thing is because for those that weren't around at that time, VHSs are actually incredibly expensive to produce. So the only viable way to do home videos was with rentals. So like the movie companies kind of had to work with Blockbuster. But then when DVDs came around, when streaming came came around, that became not as true anymore. And we're seeing some of the effects of that now with like everyone having their own streaming service. But at this mm-hmm. time, Netflix was really only the viable, the only viable streaming service, really. They were the only ones. Yeah. And so Netflix was paying all these fees because the movie companies didn't really want Netflix doing this streaming. Like they knew they were losing money because Netflix just pays the one fee and they can stream it over and over and over. They're not bound by how many discs they have. Exactly. And they were, they were making money. It was significantly becoming more and more uh, popular where people found out about Netflix. It became this viral sensation. Everyone had Netflix as everyone still basically has Netflix, but even more so before it was like the gold rush of streaming because you had access to these movies that would take you days originally to get access to and and access to movies that Blockbuster no longer held. Uh, And at this point, Blockbuster was also going out of business and, and Netflix. As was every other similar type of chain. Yes, absolutely. 
Uh, and Netflix was about a year and a half to two years ahead of all of the other streaming services with this. So you saw mm -hmm. the breadcrumbs of some things like Comcast offering some on demand, uh, Amazon Prime wasn't even existing then. It, it really was the, it really was skyrocketed ahead about a year and a half to two years ahead of all the other streaming services. Yeah, uh, which gained popularity for Netflix. Everyone suddenly was was signing up for Netflix, and Netflix had been operating in the red. They were a company that was losing money that started gaining money because mm -hmm. of this, and because of that, uh, they started charging more um, and fees for other productions. So Warner Brothers, Lionsgate, all of those started increasing their fees as well because they saw the success and saw the ability to make money. So it was this like unfeeding loop where Netflix wasn't making enough money so it raised the fee and then all of a sudden the production companies would raise their fees so Netflix would have to raise their fee again and uh, the streaming services during this time started catching up so Netflix wasn't offering anything new and there was this really stark fear that Netflix was going to become obscure but what the mass public didn't know was in the works was the Netflix original and this was the next step for Netflix to become its own production company. So in the uh, so in the spring or early, or late winter of 2013, Netflix released The House of Cards, mm -hmm. which is a the first original series from Netflix that just basically appeared. There was no real build up, there was no real advertising. It just kind of happened. It had main actors, big names, and it was a TV show. So, um, but they dropped all, I think it was 11 episodes, yep. one night at midnight. It was yep. like last night, like the end of February, just dropped it. And it went viral. Everyone had to watch uh, House of Cards. That's how it was. Everyone, it was a really good, I mean, to be honest, it was a really well-written show. The first season was badass. It had some great actors in it who have then, you know, turned out not so great. But at that time, <laughs> like the actors were very revered. Um, there was a lot of like basically writing involved. Basically what happened is Netflix dumped all of their money into House of Cards mm -hmm. and it paid off because now yep. what everyone does is binge watches, right? Everyone binge watches. And um, it's to the point where even if you have a show that does not completely release at the same time, like for example, Loki, that's really popular right now, once a week, there's probably people that have not watched a single episode because they're literally just waiting for Disney Plus to finish the season and then they're going to watch all of them because that is just how they watch TV now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just kind of, it's just kind of the thing, right? And uh, when you've got when you've got a regular TV show, there there is this kind of production line that happens, right? Where they, they film several episodes, but then while the season starts airing, they're still filming the rest of the episodes, right? But with Netflix, they film the whole season all at once in, in one go, um, which, uh, which lowers production costs, but it also changes a lot of how you produce a show. And then they release it all at once. And you can watch the whole season in one yeah. night if you really want to. And it just, it completely changes how we conceptualize what a TV show is. And, and that really, I feel like is, is what began the golden age of TV because then TV could become just a long movie. And like, when then we have like these amazing HBO shows, for example, like Game of Thrones and things like that, that are really just a long movie. So sad they never got to make the last couple of seasons for that. I wish I could have seen the ending, but alas, uh, we never did. <laughs> We have different Don't. opinions on that. <laughs> um, but uh, but so we, we enter this golden age of, of TV because TV becomes a long movie due to binge watching. And uh, and that's kind of where where we are today with it. So Landon, what, what well, do you prefer? Do you prefer to watch week to week or do you prefer to binge watch? I think um, that's a great question. I prefer to binge watch. However... Uh, I recognize that when I binge watch, I don't enjoy the production as much. I don't enjoy it as much because it's about getting through it and getting that story that I don't have to wait like that week. Right now, the shows that I'm really watching uh, are on a weekly release. And uh, so like I now am spending many a day thinking about what's going to happen next mm -hmm. or enjoying the mm -hmm. fandom bases of, of the conversation that are going to happen and the dissection of episodes. 
And a lot of that doesn't happen during binge watching. During binge watching, there right. isn't as in-depth analysis from fandom. Uh, so I personally, as a viewer, prefer binge watching, but that's just because I also grew up in the generation of instant gratification. <laughs> I think a lot of people have those mixed feelings about it, right? Because I totally agree. Being forced to wait um, creates it, like that creates fan theories and, and creates mm -hmm. fandom in a way that doesn't exist with binge watching, right? And um, and I think when we were deciding to do Shadow and Bone, um, ah, oh, Lunar, welcome, and you got first. Good job. Um, <laughs> happy to have you. You haven't missed anything yet. We're still talking about like Netflix's production. We haven't really talked about the show too much. Um, so yeah, when you have binge watching, it's kind of like the hot new thing for two weeks and then it's like gone. And we were talking about that when we wanted yeah. to do this show because I loved it so much and I wanted Landon to watch it. But literally we knew by the time we got to it, like it would be done. Like it would not be the trend anymore. It would not be in the tags, you know, and it's not. And that's, and that's some of the consequences that we are seeing when it comes to Netflix originals and the way that, that Netflix has, has, uh, made binge watching a thing right prior mm -hmm. to Netflix it really wasn't an active thought it wasn't a phrase in our vocabulary nope. uh binge watching came with Netflix original series and this mm -hmm. and this idea of dropping episodes so yes. in all the past, of a sudden binge watches were called rewatches <laughs> yes exactly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you had already seen it this is the first time like getting the theory getting the um the media to you yeah. Uh, and because of that, uh, it has changed how Netflix produces work, like work. It's all about the quality, the quantity more than the quantity these days, because Netflix is now the way that it's changed its, its platform is that it's not as much reliant on, uh, other production companies. And if they are, they're smaller production companies. So you're not seeing the large mm -hmm. new releases on Netflix. Uh, like Marvel they don't need all of their movies. They don't exactly. need them because there's a brand new TV show to binge watch every other week. Every other week. And it is that like constantly erasing and constantly dropping uh, dropping uh, shows in hopes to hit virality, in hopes mm -hmm. to get something that is going to be as viral as House of Cards, as Queer Eye, as uh, Shadow and Bone. Um, and that could be good and bad. You can have shows like Emily in Paris, which critics ripped apart worse than any CW show that there has ever been, would not have green, been greenlit on any production company, uh, but was greenlit. And because of the virality, greenlit for three more seasons, even though nobody, including fans, liked it. <laughs> People watched it for the fact that it was bad. And all of a sudden it now has a three series run. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and that's because Netflix wants to keep people engaged. It constantly needs to come out with new, new uh, content on a yep. constant and consistent basis to make that $14.99, that $15.99, that $16.99, as it keeps rising and rising and rising, worth it. Yep. Uh, and, and it also turns to uh, shows that cost less in production um, or not production necessarily, but less to make reality tv shows uh they don't require script writers they don't require writers in any case they just require yeah. producers and contestants who are it's willing not a, to do it it's not a mistake that netflix pushes that um the circle show so hard it's not a mistake it's also a great show i'm not gonna lie i applied <laughs> i applied to be on the second season i'm not gonna lie <laughs> oh wow landon if you ever got on there i would actually i would actually it would it be a hysterical <laughs> oh my god it would just be me playing dm but but it's In not a mistake. <laughs> it's, it's not a mistake that that show no. is pushed incredibly hard compared to their other shows. And it's because it's easy and cheap to make that they've That's invested right. this money in this in this property that they already did because it was a production house. And now that they're relying on volunteers and or actors slash employees to push the narratives and and rely on production rather than marketing and writing and everything like that. It's a much yep. cheaper way of doing it. It's a much faster turnaround and it's a much more way of getting viral. Yep. Um, and it is at this point, Netflix is, Netflix is all about virality and how mm -hmm. viral it can be. Mm -hmm. And because so, of that, the, the level of viral, 
lessons and less less and less and less every single time because of more and more content being pushed so again yes shadow and so this so this episode um this episode or the rest of this episode pretty much is my plea to if you missed it when it was viral (laughs) please go back and watch it there is a lot of stuff in the show that is really quality um that i think that that anyone can enjoy it is it is very much quality compared to a lot of uh Uh uh-huh Netflix's Netflix current shows. seasons. Yeah. And uh-huh. <laughs> I do believe I am double double checking, uh, but I do believe it has been greenlit for a season two. So that's my understanding as we, well. We are we gonna don't, get a season yes, two. Yes, they did. Netflix officially put out an announcement a month ago. Yes. Uh they did get greenlit for a season two, which means that we don't need it to go viral again in order to be successful, but you should watch it because it's really fucking good. <laughs> yep, exactly. Okay. All so, right. So how did it succeed? How did it succeed? All right. So the first thing that it had going for it in this in this way of virality, where virality is success, is that it already had an established fan base. Uh, the the original Shadow and Bone, Siege and Storm, and Rune and Rising came out in 2012, 2013, and 2014, uh, which was a book series in the in the Renaissance of YA. We can call late Renaissance of YA. Uh, where when they it was were in its successful. heyday, like y- YA was everywhere and doing everything at that time. Yes. Uh, they were New York Times bestsellers, they had active fan bases, and this actually exploded even more when in 2015 and 2016, Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom came out, which existed in the same world with different characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And that really engaged the fan base. So the small fan base that Shadow and Bone had exploded with Six of Crows. Yeah. Uh, and and from there, they were able to then pick up and uh, Leah was able to sell, or Leah, sorry, not Leah, Lee was able to sell the entirety of her works uh, to Netflix as a production company. Right, right. Uh, so and she so did that, there, obviously. <laughs> yeah, obviously, when you, as a writer, when you, when you have a production company who's willing to buy you work, you do it. Yep, so basically uh, Netflix, it has the production rights for Grishaverse, which is what the overall, like, that's the kind of term for the this this grouping of books that she has in this world. And so Netflix knew it was going to be successful because they already tapped into their fan base. Uh, they also took acknowledgement of who that fan base was, what age groups, what tropes they enjoyed, not even tropes, but what uh, styles they enjoyed. They really did take inspiration, I think, from CW works. Because mm-hmm. they knew that the age group and demographic that they were aiming towards enjoyed CW esque shows. Yep, because this is the thing: is these books came, these books started coming out about ten years ago, right? Mm-hmm. So they want to engage the fan base, and and I, you couldn't have engaged a fan base that loved this ten years ago by doing exactly what happened in the books ten years ago. You have to update it because tastes change, right? So the people that love that ten years ago are going to have slightly different tastes. Now, so here's the thing that the that the ad- adaptation did that I think is so freaking genius is the multiple storylines. Yes, exactly. So you're seeing like basically three different storylines going on. What does this sound like to you guys? What does this sound like to you guys for lovers of Game fantasy? Of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Exactly. Okay. So if you are somebody that loves YA and loves fantasy, what do you want? You want CW and you want Game of Thrones. Okay, that's what you want. So that's what they did. So they took the Six of Crows characters and they said, okay, if we were going to look at this series and and imagine where the Six of Crows characters might have been during the events of Shadow and Bone, let's do that. So everything that you get from the Six of Crows characters is new. So it's new content for the existing fan base. So the existing fans that are there because maybe they enjoyed Alina and her and her story, right? But they love Six of Crows as well. Let's give them some new content. So they're not just watching the book they already read. Amazing. Yeah. I also I also think that this was inc- incredible marketing for them. Um, because in a way, what this does is it greenlit guaranteed stories. So if Shadow and Bone was successful because of their already established fan base, it almost has a promise of the book that you really want, which was Six of Crows, the more popular book of the series and the one more integrated in the fan base, is on its way if you continue to watch this. It was almost like a Mm -hmm. promise to the fans of, oh, we'll give you these characters that you want, And we'll give you those stories, but you got to wait. You got to get interested in this. And it really does like have a great marketing skill for that purpose. 
Yeah, and I really love this because my understanding is that while you can just read the Six of Crows and Cro Crooked Kingdom without reading the Shadow and Bone series, there are things that happen in the Six of Crows books that for world building purposes are very confusing if you never read Shadow and Bone. So, um, so really, if they had jumped straight to Six of Crows, then they would have just been making something for the fans and the fans only, but that's not what they made. They made something for the fans and for the exact kind of person that this would have appealed to, even if they never actually got into Grishaverse. So it's like, it's just like this perfect mix, like it's this perfect mix of adaptation that shows that the, the people that were, that were running this, that, um, that were working on this property, really understood exactly what they were doing and exactly what people would want out of an adaptation. And I challenge more adaptations to do this. Don't just follow your source material, okay? That's not what makes an adaptation good. Just get, like you follow the source material, like, but make changes that make it better, that add things for people that already know the story. Like there's things in here. And so I want to go, I'm going to go off on a small tangent. There's things in here that are changed from the books, right? So uh, Alina is, um, it just, you know, it, this is 20 teens um, YA, right? She's pants. Okay. You put on the pants, you go have the magical girl adventure. Um, so in the show, there's several points where in the books that she's passive, but they made her much more active in the show. Like she's the one that goes in and kisses Alexander, right? Instead of it being the other way around. You know, she she takes charge. Now, because she's pants in the book and there's only so much they can do, the consequences to that are, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but they actually do really deeply, and you can see it in, in the show, they really deeply think about like, what would have made this better? And then they do it. It's amazing. <laughs> They really did take thought and time and care. They hired good screenwriters. They hired, uh, they really kept Leah close to the project. Uh, they were able to really expand on the world that had already been built uh, and then connect it in genre that is necess not necessarily very different from the books, but connect very different genres together. So we have a heist type, we have a romance type, uh, very beginner Y and A, all kind of mixed into one show uh which again is where you kind of get that cwe feel mm -hmm. uh but again uh because of the multiple perspectives and the care that they have put into the characters you have a more developed feel much like game of thrones yep so it yep, really yep, yep. was a successful choice that they chose to do that was able to engage fans to keep them happy also with knowing that you'll keep them in to promise later stories that they really want while also welcoming new people into it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They so just hit that really, sweet really spot so good. Yeah, it, so it good. really is. So that is how Shadow and Bone was successful. Uh, let us talk about something that is very important to the series as itself. It is, again, a fantasy series. The world building and the world that is created is incredibly important. However, the relationships are very unique and different in this. And I think that they're important to talk about and dissect. Yep. So. Yep. Something that's cool about the relationships in this in this show is it kind of does a little bit of everything. So no matter what you like, it's there for you in this show. Um, they really hit world, those tropes. Yeah. <laughs> and while world building is great, what really makes you um, you love something and stay with a property is the characters. And and in this, the characters um, really make it and the relationship dynamics that those characters have really make it. So we want to pay special attention to each of the relationships that we thought were important to building the show. We're not going to touch on every ship. We're going to touch on a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, ships, but we also have some non-ships in there too. Or at That's least true. Well, some that aren't as romantic. <laughs> yes. uh so the first one karen wants to talk about is <laughs> dark uh, lena oh my god uh, okay. and the darkling so do we want mm -hmm. to for those of for just give a rundown of who these characters are yes 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 okay so alina is our protagonist in the show she is the sun summoner the chosen one right she's going to to bring light and banish the darkness and the darkness in this is a physical thing so um there, there is, there are, there are summoners of all different types. Of uh, they can summon different elements, right? And there are rare summoners that summon shadow, and rare summoners that summon sun, right? The common, more common summoners that you see in this summon like fire and uh, and wind and water, right? But these are the rare ones. The light and the dark ones are the rare ones, and um, 
there is this physical place that was created by a shadow summoner in the show called The Fold. And it's very dangerous to get across and it creates all kind of political drama because it divides Ravka in half, which is the main country where these characters live. Um, so, so that's Alina's role is, is because she's a sun summoner and there hasn't been a sun summoner that was, that was active and alive for, for many, many, many years. Um, they see her as this savior who's going to banish the fold, right? Saint um, Alina. That's right. Saint, Saint, Saint Alina, right? Or Santa Alina. Um, there's, the, there's different languages in the show, so you get different words that mean the same thing, right? And then there's the Darkling. So the Darkling is this uh, is who created the fold, right? And he is uh, he's a, a character of myth that we think doesn't exist anymore. But haha, we find out that's not the case. Um, the sh- the, the villain's the- been there the whole time. <laughs> yeah, the the current living shadow summoner actually is the Darkling, and he's been alive for hundreds and hundreds of years. So shadow summoners and and sun summoners are not only rare, but they are effectively immortal. It is very hard to kill them, and they and during their life they stay very uh, very uh, youthful. They age very slowly, right? Yeah. And we'll talk we'll talk later about the other shadow summoner. I know I know Kerrigan's not the only one, okay. I know. We'll talk about her. Um but so so you've literally got darkness and light. And you know, like I cannot help myself. Opposite um, of the Yeah, like and so well, this is you... this is the thing with them is <laughs> it's literally like just hitting all the tropes that I that I want, right? And um and and like they they meet and she's nervous about him and it's very like oh what's going on but he's like very intrigued by her it's like ooh oh my gosh this is interesting this is a, a being of light that's my equal whoa and then they they kind of like and then she's like oh kind of flirting with him and he's like oh she likes me wow let's do that too and so then they like get together but then we we find out like he's the villain and so she's like no I don't love you anymore you used me. <laughs> and, this and is so exactly then they break it. This up. Is the dialogue. This is the dialogue. Yeah, that's how, that's that's how it used. goes. Uh, right. So then, so then they break up, and uh, oh, they can't be together, even though they're the same but opposite. And oh my gosh, it's so tragic. Even though they're the only ones who will ever understand each other. Oh my uh, god, you know what? Right, though, <laughs> listening to this, you know what this? I I realized this in this moment. We didn't talk about this, but oh my gosh, does this show harken back to my Clara line feels? Oh yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Like also mm-hmm. like this dark old monster who only ever has a soft spot for this like light young bubbly girl. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely has those there too. Yep. So, so these so. two characters they are they are equals, but they're opposites. So if you haven't if you haven't watched the show and if you haven't figured it out from what I'm saying by now, the I'll tell you. Like it turns out that she's probably going to be effectively immortal too and have a very very long life that could potentially last thousands of years if she takes care of herself, right? And so, you know, to, from from the Darkling's point of view, because he has lived hundreds of years at this point. Like he's not lived thousands, but he's lived hundreds of years at this point. Um, you know, from his point of view, it doesn't really matter how she feels about anyone else because all of those people are eventually going to die. So who gives a flying fuck? You know, I'm going to be the only one still here. So, um, kudos to me, right? Like that's his perspective on, on this is there's no way anyone else could ever be her equal. So who cares what she thinks about them? I mean, and understandable from the, from the like point of view of of a evil <laughs> immortal person right mm-hmm. uh but i i think that it's um also like you're not winning any favors with that kerrigan <laughs> 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 you're not being successful with that uh right? no it's a really it's a really interesting ship i think that um what comes into play and we'll talk a little bit more about kerrigan or character but he there's like this idea that I had a really tough time with because as a writer I am trained to pick up what writers are putting down right uh so like there's this idea that we're supposed to be surprised that he ends up being the villain and so we're supposed to be like really rooting for this relationship uh and then all of a sudden like not root for it (laughs) because (laughs) we found out something that we knew all along like it's it's a little bit of a complicated thing um 
it's and only it's, surprising it's, shown... it's only surprising if you're like 13 reading this book you know like maybe it's surprising to like really well young it doesn't YA happen fans, in the book but, you know yeah it's not yeah. even a thing that happens in the book, right? That's it, right, like, you're right. It does. He has emotions for her because he's, it's more of that, like, oh, this is another human being who's going to live forever. It's yep. more of that thing. But she develops feelings for him in the TV show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it, it's very interesting. A way that they, like, portray this sudden, like, we're rooting for him and then we're not rooting for him is, is a thing about consent. Yeah. Uh, so like there's this great scene where Darkling, yo, even even evil villains ask for consent when kissing people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do it like Ben Barnes does. Uh, and then you do it. It's like a whole scene and it's great and fantastic and awesome. And then it's interrupted and nothing comes of it. Uh, and then he literally three episodes later, two episodes later, like takes over and mutilates her body and doesn't ask for consent because at this point we know that he's we know he's villain. yeah yeah uh, so it's so like it's, like it's a... this <laughs> it, it, it creates an inconsistency in the character because what we're supposed to get as the audience is like well if you're a nice if you're if you're a good person you would always ask for consent you know and that's just not that's not real <laughs> <laughs> but then again like real. as an audience member we also know that he's evil but not supposed to know that he's evil mm-hmm. it's the whole thing and it's an interesting take on the character and the writing aspect of it but it really does show like the the writer's hand and this interesting dichotomy like dichotomy between like when they were on the same page and when they weren't yep 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 so Um, as soon as we know he's a villain then he doesn't need her consent anymore because the audience is aware that he's evil (gasps) yeah and it's (laughs) it's and it's shown in such ways uh like where he is the one who exposes her powers like she can only perform her powers when he is around helping her yeah uh to the point of like even that he wants her to be reliant on him yeah he doesn't Uh, want her doing the training that she does like he never supports that or or talks about it with her anything like it's just this other thing that's happening yeah and there's there's also like this idea of um he has like a lot of possession like he wants to possess her Mm -hmm. in interesting ways and he and he shows that even even when he is the good guy Mm -hmm. uh by you know wanting her to dress in his colors uh and then later uh, like physically bio horror attaching them to each like can making a connection uh with yeah, body the, oh my god okay the, the body <laughs> horror of that scene where she's like getting the necklace put on like oh my god y'all props to the makeup team that really scene was scene. so good so good and one it was of my really, favorite scenes it was a really interesting like writing choice too uh to have something like that is physically connecting the both of them mm-hmm. uh and yeah, in a way that she can then my understanding in the book is it's more like just a necklace yes that she wears and but like in the show like it's the antlers like sink into her body and become part of her yeah and his coin does the same thing Mm -hmm. uh and it it makes them have a connection um and Mm -hmm. it's again that possession he possesses her in those moments so really you see that that consistent character throughout the show, which is incredibly important because when you do have this big reveal of, oh, the good guy turns out to be a bad guy, uh, there is, again, like with the consent, non-consent thing, it, sometimes like such a stark difference that because you want the audience to really root for the guy and then you don't. Uh, and in this particular one, it's, it's pretty well done for the most part all the way through because you have the possession before when he's still a good guy and the possessive nature after yeah. uh and then the interesting like she needs him to show her powers and then in the end she he is the one that she is using her powers against like it's this really yeah. nice story arc uh yeah, and shows really the relationship really change overall but she, and you know what i'm not boring so even though he's evil I'm still rooting for them. I mean, I I'm think in a hundred years or so it, it could happen. You know, I mean, uh, I don't think I don't think that he's wrong. What he says. Spoiler now. alert! I think he dies at the end of the series. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, he dies at the end of this series because there's no body. So obviously he's dead. 
we'll talk about we'll that talk about bit. that he's he's not like the final scene reveals that that's Ugh. not the case but yeah A trope that i um, hate Anyways, yeah we'll talk about that in a second but but yeah so okay so because i'm not boring i i love dark lena and i think that it's great and i don't expect it to happen in canon i expect it to happen in the fanfic that i write about alina and kerrigan living 200 years in the future right like but that's listen. that's my dream <laughs> if you're boring do we have a ship for you okay <laughs> I'm very, very sorry. I'm very sorry on the Molina to the Molina shippers. But I'm about oh to hate on y'all for just a second. This is so boring. All right, okay, this is context. so boring. Here, I'll okay, describe. yeah, give context. I'll, give I'll context describe. Before I start complaining uh, a lot. <laughs> Mal and Alina. So we have Alina, our protagonist, who is hidden the fact that she is a Grisha and or able of doing magic for her entirety of her life until she goes to war where her childhood friend almost dies and then bam turns out she's the chosen one right that's her story yeah. well then you have the childhood friend mal they grew up in an orphanage together uh mal is a wholesome decent plain white t-shirt kind of guy he, he's, uh, he's a guy's guy he just he does he's a guy guys things guys and, you know you know where melina is melina is pants mal is the shirt like it's really there's really, really not much i to mean him. they're the same they're the same character right they're yes. they're meant for someone to fill in the blank when reading in ya we've talked about this with harry potter and the inv invention of ya but there are certain characters in ya that are typically the protagonist and the love interest that are blank canvases that you get a few details about, usually physical details, and then nothing else because you want to project what you want into them, whether it be that you want to be Alina or you want Amal to love you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Mal and Alina suffer from this. And they, because of the medium, it changes a little bit. Alina is a little less pants. Mal is a little less of a white t-shirt. However, he's still fucking boring. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mal's best scenes are his scenes that don't include Alina. His scenes no, with Kerrigan are good. His scenes with his two friends when he's hunting when he's hunting the stag, good. The scenes with yeah. Alina, I'm sorry. Like if I was gonna watch this a third time, I fast forward. <laughs> it's and he's. I mean, his nothing on the actor. I think the actor actually did great job oh, no, trying he's to good. make him an interesting character. Um, I I just think that, and I'm not even angry that a lot of his motivation came from Alina. I think the the big issue is is that Alina is in love with Mal from from since she can remember. She's loved him all her life. She's never told him. It's that unrequited love, the not wanting to fuck it up. That you're the only person in the world for me. Again, they're both orphans. They exist in a world that isn't built for them. Um, neither of them feel special, and they have each other. And that connection of wanting and Mal kind of just exists through all of that. He doesn't, mm -hmm. he doesn't find out Alina is in love with him. He is not in love with Alina through any of that. Um, nope. He is just like, oh man, Alina, you're a really dependable friend. Uh, let me go fuck a bunch of other women <laughs> and then tell you about it. Um, and, and he doesn't really add anything. He is, and in the show, they address this as if this thing is Mal is what is holding her back from being able to come into her powers. And when she lets Mal go, she's able to embrace the fact that she is Grisha, that she is powerful, that she has these magic abilities. Uh, and Mal really is like the damper to not allow for this. And what that has caused is really an unlikable ship because mm -hmm. they're not putting in the best of each other and they're also not inciting the worst in each other. They're just supposed to like be in love with each other. And Mal doesn't realize he loves her until after she's gone. Pretty much, like he doesn't uh, realize he loves like her. Which also is the most anti-feminist. Yeah, plot it's line so that weird. <laughs> it's, it's so weird. Like he doesn't he doesn't recognize that he cares about her as more than a friend until he realizes that his only connection with her is writing her letters. Like it takes that long for him to realize it. And I and I, I guess this is oh, this is a little bit like I'm just getting too old for this shit. Um, so I'm gonna just be an old person for a second and say like this makes no sense. I I don't mind childhood friends to lovers. I really really don't. But I need a reason for it. Like okay. 
some good reasons that I think that I think make sense. Um, if you've got like uh, a lot of homophobia in in the world that you're writing in, and um, and the two friends like don't realize one of them doesn't realize that they're gay. Like I think that's a childhood friends to lovers where you don't have a confession that makes a lot of sense, right? If there's there's some mm -hmm. kind of queerness going on and there's queer phobia going on, right? Like that makes sense. If if the childhood friends were friends as kids and then you know somewhere in their teenage years they got separated for years and years and years and then they come back together as adults, I think that that makes sense, right? Right? So there are situations where childhood long term friends to relationship. Lovers, One of the yeah. person is in a long term relationship right. doesn't want to ruin the friendship that way. Exactly. Yeah. That makes sense. Like sometime in their teenage years, one of the friends got with who have who they ended up marrying. And so therefore they never got with their friend. Right. Or even expressed their feelings at like yeah. early in the teenage years and then like was rejected and then never wanted to do that again. Like that, that makes sense too. Reasons. Like there are there are ways that make childhood friends to lovers something that I can have interest in, right? But this not what happens in this. So these two characters are seventeen. They're supposed to be seventeen. Obviously, they don't look seventeen because who's going to cast a seventeen year old in your in your Game of Thrones CW show? Nobody. But <laughs> they are seventeen. So they're seventeen. They have known each other for literally their whole lives. They they grew up together because they both lived in the same orphanage growing up. They work together because they both work for the army, right? They have different jobs, but they're they're they're, they work together and see each other. They see each other literally every day. And you expect me to believe that she made it to 17 without ever hinting at it or like a, a drunken kiss or, or anything. Like I just well, don't buy it. And that's the other thing that's really hard about the show is that they, they are not believable 17 year olds. Well, that's true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the actors are, are obviously in their mid 20s, late 20s. Uh, and they don't act like 17 year olds. They're not making decisions like 17 year olds. So it's also really hard to, rem like I had to actively, I had to write in my notes in every single, in every single episode after episode three, that they are 17. Uh, because the show doesn't do anything to prove that. No, they act um, like 20 so that when you So that when you have like that friend, like childhood friends to lovers, like I'm sitting here and being like, oh my God, they're like my age and they haven't said anything. That's unrealistic. <laughs> Yeah, it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense to me. Like there was never like a, a there was never like an argument that they had where the, this ended up coming out. There was never like a drunken night where this ended up coming out. Like I just don't buy it. I just it's, don't buy it. It it doesn't make any sense and therefore it doesn't it doesn't lead to an interesting story arc. Like Yeah. So like this is the problem with it. This is the problem with it. Hi, Brenny, real quick. So here's my big problem with it is that it, within the narrative of the show, Malina is clearly endgame. That's how I would write it too, even though I would write Mal totally differently. But like Malina's endgame, I, I get it. I would write it that way too. I 100% agree. But because their dynamic is so boring as an audience member, I can't bring myself to care. And that's not well, like, good. <laughs> and if you read the overall story arc, what what her arc is is Mal has to lie and never come into her own or out not sorry not Mal Alina yeah Alina has to lie can never be her true self until she almost loses Mal saves him is taken away from him discovers that in order to become herself and her true self she has to let him go lets him go they discover each other after everybody in this new world that has led her to her being her stronger version of herself actually turns out to be liars and have betrayed her. Uh, and, and then they find each other. Mal hasn't changed at all other than coming to the realization that he is in love with her, but his character hasn't gone through anything other mm -hmm. than that realization. And now she's supposed to go back to what she was before, except stronger and better and more accepting of herself. Right. It, it's almost it's like it's almost like the only really thing that can make lesson. it really is. And it's almost like the only thing that can make Mal um, committed to Alina in a romantic way is for is for her to be strong. And then it just is like, well, then why? Why did he hold her back? Like, I just, I don't understand. Cause like, if I think, if I think about this um, from the perspective of like, what was probably actually happening. So, so what, one of the things that Alina does in her childhood is she, um, she refuses to take the test to determine if she's Grisha because Mal is injured at that time. And so he can't take the test. So she sets up, sets it up to make sure that the test fails for her. Right. And why does Mal never be like, Alina, that's really stupid. I can't believe you did that. That's awful. Like, why was this not a big blowout fight? If Mal really cared about Alina and what her success he in life, 
Yeah, well, no, but once even once he finds out, even once he finds out that she didn't know, you know, and that she and that she tricked the test and all of this stuff, like he's not that mad at her. He's just kind of a little bit yeah. frustrated. Like I just don't understand. I, like he just doesn't seem he doesn't seem to like care about her as her own person. You just don't see a lot of evidence of that. Well, it's this idea of I love you so much I'm willing to sacrifice everything I am for you. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm not again, about it. I'm very, not about it. Very YA, understanding that that's a very YA trope. Yep. It's a very young adult way and teenage way of looking at love. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it's not interesting. Because yeah, but a teenager didn't write this, it. right? Even though the characters are teenagers, a teenager didn't write this. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> but it is like, but I can understand why people connect to it because oh, yeah. they do have because it, that is the age demographic, right? Oh, what, yeah. This is a YA story, and that's so, a young adult novel. Mm-hmm. I just think as an as a adult watching this show, this does not resonate. Yeah, and that's why I say like I'm gonna be an old person for a minute when I complain about Melina. Like it's totally just me being an old person and just not having patience for this ty- this way of doing the childhood friends to lovers trope anymore. And I also think that this 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 wasn't marketed to to YA people. It was marketed more to our demographic ish, maybe a little younger than us, but not like twelve to seventeen. No, um, to twenty. It was definitely marketed to twenty somethings. Twenty somethings. You know. Um and. It's because of that, I think that that is why there is no one talking about Melina. <laughs> like mm-hmm. in the fandom, if you're looking at fandom, it's dark. It's Lina. all dark Lena. There it's was so all... many darkling memes that happened when this was in its mm-hmm. virality, but yep. Melina the, was not mentioned. The fandom is all about dark Lena and the Crows trio. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, anyway, that's Melina. If you like Melina, congratulations on being correct. You're you're going to get your end game, but I, I mean, really I'm will. just going to sleep through it, I guess. That's all I know to say to that. <laughs> well, speaking of sleeping, we'll go to another one. Okay, uh. so Matthias and Nina. <laughs> Matthias and Nina. I'm really sorry, guys, that we had... Oh, yeah. oh uh-oh. Spoilers. Spoilers for... There we go. <laughs> okay, so um, so we had a lot of praise about the show, but we we do have these couple of things that we really dislike. So so Melina is one of them. This is the other one, and it's not because I dislike enemies to lovers, or even that I dislike the characters. I actually love these characters and love these tropes. This is the kind of thing that I'm normally very interested in. You have an enemies to lovers where the two characters are from different cultures, and the cultures collide, and they they don't understand each other at first, and they have to learn to figure to understand each other, and and their cultural you know background is telling them to not trust this other person and it's like this crazy complicated like i love that shit i love that shit unfortunately it's incredibly underdeveloped so we just it just doesn't have the impact that it should have if they had given this ship anywhere between 30 and 45 more minutes throughout the entire season of airtime or development this would have been the story Oh, yeah. If this had been, um, like, instead of an eight-episode run, if this had been, like, a ten-episode run, and they gave yeah. us more Matthias and Nina, I would have or been, like, even... in love with this. I would have been, like, this is my ship. It wouldn't have been Dark Lena. It would have been Matthias and Nina, you know? Or would have taken, taken out some of the, like, Mal just pining. Um, mm-hmm. so, like, there are some things that they could have made different choices that even in an eight-episode run. They could have introduced yeah. Nina an episode earlier. Like, the fact yeah, that... Yeah, she doesn't come until episode three. Episode three. Yeah, the fact that this ship doesn't begin until the end of episode three, and we are supposed to believe that they're so fully in love that the betrayal at the end of episode eight is damaging and hurtful to Matthias uh, to the point that to the point that he and Nina basically split up is is unrealistic like especially with the very little time that they got (laughs) so so to give y'all to give y'all an idea i I feel we forgot to do this for this one like we did for those but let's give a little summary Uh, these these guys aren't in episode five either so they're literally just in the end of episode three and then they're in episode four six seven eight okay so that's all they get so this is what happens half the season yeah so so nina is is a soldier just like um just like uh you know mal and alina are basically she works for kerrigan she's one of his soldiers and so she's um, a grisha shoulder yeah so shoulder. she's a grisha she has powers and stuff so that's cool and uh and matthias is from a different country and in that country grisha 
um, are are killed. Basically, they're considered they're considered evil. They're considered sacrilegious. Witches. And yeah, so they're they're witches, like in in that kind of like you know witch hunt type of sense. And um, and he is literally a witch hunter. That is his occupation. He goes around his country and the neighboring countries looking for witches to bring to trial, which basically means they die. Like you don't, it, you know, it's it's a witch trial. You don't. It's not a real trial. And so. Nina and Matthias end up crossing paths and Nina becomes Matthias's prisoner and he's going to take her back to his country where she can stand trial for her crimes, her crimes of being a witch. And he has all these crazy <laughs> ideas. Yeah. And he has all these crazy ideas of what witches are and, and how Grisha operate and how Grisha think. And through getting and to know the, Nina. And oh, she's yeah, go a ahead. heart. She's, oh, I was going to say she, oh, yeah, she's, she's a heart render. Worst. She's a heart mender, so she's, the, so she's worst the worst kind of, kind of Grisha. Because the worst she can kind. make you feel she can make you feel things that you don't truly feel. Yes, because essentially what her power does is manipulates physical bodies, right? So she can like literally change um, the way that your heart beats, the way that your lungs, you know, are breathing, like th like internal. She can change the internal chemistry of creatures. Basically, that's what she can do. So she's the worst but, kind of witch. Yeah. So she can, so she can calm you, like if you are having anxiety or nervous or scared, she can calm you down, mm -hmm. which then like psychologically humans then are like, oh, this person calms me down as a good person to be around. I feel calm mm -hmm. and at home around. And that's, so it's like this idea of the heart render affects emotions, which yeah. is not what their power does, but they're, that's what they say is happening. Yeah. So then, so then this is basically, so from, from Matthias's perspective, she is the worst kind of witch. Well, they turn, they get, so they're on a ship and they get into a shipwreck and they're, they survive and they find each other during there. And, um, and they basically help each other, um, survive in the wilderness and, and grow closer. And Matthias learns that, you know, Nina is actually a full person with normal motivations and, you know, has like, <laughs> has feelings She's a human and a past. Being. And then, and she, and she realizes, you know, that, that Matthias doesn't necessarily hunt Grisha because he's a bad person, but because he's been raised to understand Grisha in, in a poor way. So, right, they, they come together and um, because they get so little screen time, and you can kind of probably tell where I'm going with this based on my description of how it happens, because they get so little screen time and we don't get to really see them bond very much, um, it kind of, it kind of looks really racist. This plot ends up being super, super racist. Um, it kind of, yeah. and it kind of like, it kind of turns into like, uh, what it ends up looking like is that until we get to the very end, is that Nina's this this good person and Matthias is a bad person and Matthias has to learn how to be less bad and he learns that because he thinks this Grisha is hot stuff and he wants to do her. Like that's basically what we end up getting because there's just so little screen time to build up their relationship on, on an emotional level. They kind of cut corners and it builds up on a physical level. That's what happens. So... Is just just a little tiny bit racist. A little tiny like bit. I said, if they gave us thirty more minutes throughout the entire season, even if it was over two episodes, mm -hmm. um, it would be great. If they snuck yep, in cause... during episode five, uh, some yep. more scenes, it would have been great. Yep, because like their bonding, their their main bonding scene where they're in the cave and like the sexy stuff happens, right? Y'all, it's good. Y'all, it's so hot. I'm not gonna lie, it it's, really is. But that's and it's all a we great get. Great story. Yeah, and, and it but really that's all we is get. a great story. And it ends. It ends with uh, Nina is being hunted by Kerrigan to like return to to Kerrigan and mm -hmm. is and is. But she doesn't want to be a soldier anymore. She decides she doesn't want to be a soldier she, anymore. Yeah, she realizes <laughs> that she loves Matthias so much that she doesn't want to be a soldier. She no longer wants to be under Kerrigan's thumb, and uh, they then threaten Matthias. And the only way to get past that threat is to accuse uh, him of being a slaver. And there are some some people who hunt slavers in the bar in which this is happening. So Matthias gets under arrest, is arrested. And Nina is like, I'm going to get you out of here. And Matthias is like, you tricked me this whole time. I thought it was real and you you don't. And it's like, because of how little development there is, it's like, I don't believe it. Are you really yeah. that hurt? <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's like y'all had one night where you got kind of hot and heavy and that was it you know and it's like and then you realize that she gets <laughs> cold like yeah <laughs> she almost died of, yeah it's like nothing 
It's just, yeah. So, so, and it's really sad because it could have been good because that ending is actually, if they had had more screen time and developed them more, that ending is actually really good because she basically does the same thing to Matthias that he did to her. Like, she says, oh, it's fine. You know, you'll just you'll just go to trial and then you'll get out. And then one of the other prisoners is like, like basically, I can't remember how it phrases it, but anyway, it's basically like, you know, he's going to sit in that jail cell for like three, four years before the trial even yeah. happens. And then she's like horrified, like, oh shit, I did the same thing to him that he did to me. And not not understanding how this works with the way that um that, that slavers are, are brought to trial, right? And so but it could have been so cool, but we just don't get enough time with them. It's fine. The crows will get about next season. Yes. Um. <laughs> And so I'm hoping, I'm hoping for good things for Matthias and Nina for season two. I want to like this ship. I feel like it hits a lot of things that I, that I like. I love enemies to lovers. Okay. I love enemies mm-hmm. to lovers and I love culture clashes. So I just feel like I could love this ship, but because there's not enough time, I just end up feeling like, oh, this is just, this is just kind of racist. It's just not developed and it has racist undertones because of it. Mm-hmm. 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 Shall yep. we? Next. Okay, we're going to stop All complaining right. now. Time to stop complaining and talk so about um, Kazan and Ej and Landon ship. Okay, go. <laughs> Are they... I don't even know if they're, a, if they're a ship in Six of Crows. I did not read about Six of Crows uh, because I technically want to read Six of Crows after watching the, fan, the show. In the, fandom, in the fandom they are. <laughs> okay, because I'm like, first of all, the amount of like just glances and being able to read each other. Also, very tall, very short makes me happy uh they look so that, cute that together picture, do they not that picture that on the screenshot? right where she's yes. like so small and he is so tall is just perfect um but no it's a very interesting the, the relationship dynamics between the uh between the six of cr- the crows is just is is fascinating uh because you have kaz who is like the head honcho the the leader the sherlockian type the 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 person who is who is the brains of the operation you have Inej who is incredibly skilled uh at being in places that she shouldn't be in and not getting caught and also really good at killing people even Mm -hmm. though she doesn't want to kill people (laughs) uh and then you have Jesper who is a mess (laughs) who's just he is just a mess of the whole I like I think my notes were like Jesper is useless and I am Jesper (laughs) (laughs) He's Jesper, also though, fantastic. for real, like one of the best characters. Like, let's not, reads, you know. I think he reads people incredibly well. Like, that's oh, Jesper. Yeah. Jesper is the reader of people, mm-hmm. uh, but he's also a hot fucking mess, and I love mm-hmm. him for it. <laughs> uh, so, the dynamic between the three of these unlikely people very interesting, and the way that the show builds it up very heist like, very like get in, get out, let's do our thing. Uh, but something between Inej and J- Kaz is just this unspoken unsaid Mm -hmm. like tension and we don't because this is a six of crows prequel and we don't get too much time focused on the hows and the whys this came to be uh we don't know much about kaz at all uh, other than that he runs a casino uh and money is important to him and he has a limp so at some point he's gotten hurt Mm -hmm. Uh, and he's very and he's very aware and conscious of his body because of that and he hate like he there's a lot of self-hate that comes from that yeah like Uh, you can see see look at how far look at how far apart they are and i'm telling y'all this is a ship like nobody touches kaz okay listen kaz 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 doesn't do hugs he doesn't do high fives you maybe might get a fist bump and he'll use the cane for it like that's that's like how kaz is (laughs) he is he is a wall of just no wonder why i love him he's emotionally unavailable (laughs) He is the like, definition so, of emotionally so unavailable. Inej, so that y'all understand the dynamic here for those that haven't watched it. Yeah. Inej is an indentured, which is the word for slave in this world. So she she is a slave. She works for the menagerie, which is a which is a place that um that basically has a bunch of indentureds like her, and they can be hired out for various jobs of whatever it is, right? And and everything that you it's, think of you'll go ahead. Uh, I was like, it's mostly prostitution, though. Yeah, it's mostly sure. prostitution. <laughs> it's mostly prostitution. But any job that you can think of that um, that you might want to hire someone for, um, that's like kind of at that that's at that level, that's like you know doesn't really have any rights, then uh, then that's what that's what indentureds do. Mm-hmm. And um, 
and Inej in particular, she's she's like she's a little rogue. She's a spy. Okay, so Kaz, being the good casino owner that he is, um, he he purchases her often, um, <laughs> often, and and pretty permanently. Like yeah, like he'll just where, he just keeps paying. Show... He just keeps paying to have her as part of his crew, right? And and their whole their whole plot together is basically Kaz is trying his best to buy Inej permanently with the idea that he's going to set her free and she's not going to be an indentured anymore. And she yep. and she is really interested in this because her main thing, like her, her, her motivation is to be free. That's her goal throughout this show is she's trying to do everything she can to, to get her status as a free person. And, and also um, relate and also continue to be, morally good within her religion she mm-hmm. religion is incredibly important to Inez yes. so that's also on top of this the other thing is is that Kaz is not told Inez's plan like there's like very little communication she, he hints at it at the end but it, she he's not like yeah I'm trying to buy you <laughs> he's just but they, like but that's clearly we need this happening. money yeah, oh, like yeah. that's but they don't talk about it. Like they don't No, talk about and she it. and she doesn't really like she's like, why do we need this money? And Kat, you can see Kaz thinking so that I can buy your freedom. Yeah. <laughs> and she's also like, but it's fine. Um, yeah. so yeah, it's a whole it's a whole thing and it's a great dynamic. Like it's it really adds tension and it really sets development to both of these characters without developing them. Mm-hmm. Um, because there was a pointed decision, I think. We saw a backstory with Alina. We saw flashbacks with Kerrigan. We saw Nina have flashbacks and Matthias and Matthias talk about uh, his history. There is no discussion other than Inej hinting at things every once in a while. There is yeah. no discussion of past and previous things with the Crows. No, we get uh, like this one little good. scene. We get this one little scene where Inej is looking at a, at a list of um, of people that have passed away, trying to cross the fold, and she's like, "Oh, maybe some of my family members are on this list, and then I can know what mm-hmm. for sure what happened to them." And uh, they're not. She doesn't find their names, but um, but that's like the only bit that we get that really has anything to do with any of the crow's past. Is that one? Scene. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a very pointed decision that I think adds depth to the characters without actually giving them depth Mm -hmm. uh and it's great it's good writing and good development for to remain mysterious but that also means that it's like i want to know more but that's what you're i want to understand y'all this is the thing this is a perfect example of how you don't have to explain everything right like Mm -hmm. remember how much i was complaining about mal and alina not confessing to each other I don't care that Inej and Kaz didn't confess to each other because I don't know how they met. I don't know their past. All I know is what I'm presented in the present timeline and I get why they wouldn't confess to each other right now. I, yeah, I 100% understand that. But a part of me, well, like we don't even know how they feel about each other too because that's something that they don't talk. Like there isn't at any point where Inej is like gossiping with Jasper being like, I really love Kaz. And Kaz is like, like, actually- Inej has pretty eyes. (laughs) Yeah. The only thing that we ever get is that Inej is really upset with Kaz for just like just giving up towards the end. Yeah. Um, and she's like, that's it. And like you get the sense from what she says that that she's upset with like, you know, how she's not going to be able to get free. And that means she's probably going to have to go back to the man- menagerie. Kaz isn't going to be able to afford her anymore because of all the things that have happened. Right. So she's upset that she's going to have to go work for the menagerie again, instead of working for Kaz. So we don't really know that there's a romantic feeling there, but there is like, that's, that's, but clearly there, how, that's, that's clearly how the actress playing Inej is portraying it. You know, that she's her choice is to stay with Kaz and she likes him, you know? Um, but, but we don't have, we don't have anything explicit. There is no meet me at the meadow with Inej yeah. and Kaz, you know, <laughs> I know, right? No, and, and it does, it makes you intrigued. And I want to know more. I want to understand why Kaz looks at Inej and goes, this one is mm-hmm. the one. Mm-hmm. Uh, when there are, like, not... as mentioned, plenty of other people who yeah. are capable of, she, of being successful. She's not the only good spy in their city. There are uh-huh. lots of them. But yeah, they're from her. a city of spies, basically. Yeah. Yeah, but he wants her. So, so it's a very interesting relationship that is happening within the show. And 
I think is brought to the forefront and is not obvious. It's like obviously not a relationship that is meant to be in the forefront. It's not Dark Lena. It's not Mal and Alina. It's not, it's not Nina, Nina and um, Matthias. It's, it's not even a relationship in terms of the show but it is one that pushes the story forward and makes it interesting it's so good it's so good. so it's it's really good we love the uh, and then the, and then the <laughs> last relationship that i think is is incredibly important for us to talk about uh is the darkling and his mother yeah so i is told you i know there's another mom. yeah so i know there's another shadow summoner i told y'all that so here's the other shadow summoner it's kirigan's mom so kirigan's mom is where Kirigan's probably lived, has lived for hundreds of years. His mom is basically implied. It's we know we're not told this in the show, but it's implied that she's lived for thousands of years because shadow summoners are basically immortal, and she looks rather old, right? So she's obviously been around a long, long, long time. And you find out in flashbacks of Kirigan that the whole reason that Kirigan has decided that power is the thing for him to have is because that's literally what his mother told him he needed to do to survive, like. He is taught by his mom to be an underhanded dick. <laughs> like, literally, she says to him, go hide and change your name. And then when this king dies and there's a new king, um, appear again and, and, and lead his army for him, just like you did before. You know, this king has rejected you, but just do the same thing with the next king. It's fine. We live forever. Oh, something weird happened on All your right. screen, Landon. Oh, there we go. Nope, we good. Yeah, and so, like, she literally tells him, and this is crazy because those, that's the flashback scene that we get, but the, in the events of the show, like, she's trying to take him down, but she made him. So this is something that, like, the show doesn't ex doesn't acknowledge is happening, but we as the audience see that that's what's happening, and, uh, and oh my gosh, it's so good. I really like this relationship. It's... <sighs> I had a lot of... I actually had a lot of issues with it. You said um, it, you're, you're, you struggle with like it making sense, right? Yeah, for me, I, I sat there and I like, I do appreciate like that she made him, but there's also like an idea that he can't do anything right. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> that she's, she's very angry that he's not protecting the people, but at the same time, uh, is angry how he protects the people. Mm hmm. <laughs> actively working against him but also won't actively work against him like it's it's a very interesting dynamic that I sat there and I was like I don't know if this really adds anything to the story so uh, this is the I, way I that I see it I'm oh, sorry go ahead I thought you were no, go ahead you go, go. okay so this is the way that I see it so the way I see um see this character is that she is benefiting from the status quo while also thinking the status quo is wrong. And if you think about people that are like that in reality, right, that mm -hmm. benefit from the status quo, while also recognizing that the status quo is not right and we should change things, this is how they act. They talk a lot of talk, but when push comes to shove, they're not actually going to do anything to change the status quo. They're going to try to keep the status quo, whatever it is. And that's what she does. So that is her function in the story as is the care is a character that um that is trying to keep the status quo while act while speaking against it at the same time which that happens in our world like i'm sure there's there's people that you thought of that were just that are just like you know they don't want to actually do the things that it would take to to enact change in the world and that's where she's at she doesn't want change she wants things to say exactly how they are i 100 percent understand that as a real life person I just don't think it was a successful character in this world probably uh, not because I think it's incredibly time. yeah and I think and I think it's incredibly like the nuance of that is incredibly difficult to write in a character yeah uh and and almost needs to be explicitly said especially to audience members mm -hmm. who won't pick up on the subtleties of that and she's and she's not a perspective character she's not a pov character in this we get like the yeah. um the pov of kaz we get the pov of alina we get the pov of the darkling we never get her pov bagra doesn't have any pov parts yeah and and, and which is which is good because she's a, such a side character like she literally yeah. is i think the purpose of her being there is to scold kira again enough to make him feel like he necessary he has to create the fold in order to save people Mm -hmm. uh, and to inspire Elena to move against Kerrigan. Like those yeah. are, I think, the reasoning that the character exists. 
Uh, and there isn't yeah. enough development between those two things to understand why those two are related. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this that um, Bagra does does suffer from underdevelopment for sure. Again, like there's just there's parts of this that I feel like if we had had a ten episode run instead of an eight episode run, that um, that would have elevated this so much more even now than it already is and uh and having just enough having just a little bit more time with um with alina's training with bagra and some and some time with bag bagra has like an assistant too which only appears in like two scenes and then dies um if we had had some maybe a, a more explicit scene between bagra and that girl um that would have probably helped but again, there's only eight episodes, and I don't know what you would have cut other than some of Mal's brooding. That's like the, most of this. Most <laughs> of this story is real tight. Like there really no, isn't much is, to cut is here. Very Everything tight. is there important. There is no fluff. Yeah, yeah no, there's it no is, fluff. It is in, and even Mal's brooding is some. Form it's really of not fluff. Development for it's really Mal, not fluff. Like I just basically don't like it. <laughs> we just want to cut Mal in general. <laughs> But yeah, so I, I think for me, and again, that underdevelopment, that was just something that wasn't quite there yet. Uh, that mm -hmm. I think that if it is going to be an important part of his character, which they were trying to make it, uh, she needed to be more important. Yeah. Yeah. So. Agreed. All right. Ooh, hold on. No, you're oh, right. Let's I get into the spicy was... stuff. Cool. Let's get into the spicy stuff. Um, I thought there was another slide in between that and that. All right. So let's move on from relationships and talk about some things that the, uh, that the show did successfully. Or yeah. not successfully, sorry. Let's talk about uh, some of the, the racism and, and uh, marginalized people in the show and how that is shown. And so yeah. as you can see, bigotry is a theme within the show. Yep. Uh, and this is shown first and foremost by the idea that is built into the world that magic makes you marginalized. Mm -hmm. uh, you're sent away upon testing positive for magic. Yeah, that's how it works in Ravka. Yep, the most powerful people. Are, yeah, uh, so in Ravka, you are sent away to go join the army to basically become children slate or to become children uh, warriors until you're grown up and then you're adult warriors and that's your life. Uh, yeah. And in other countries, you're killed, as we mm -hmm. talked about. Uh, the most powerful are locked away with no choice left yeah. for their own good and for the good of the war. Uh Yep. And a lot of indentured, a lot of indentured are Grisha and made indentured because mm -hmm. of their Grisha status. Yes. And, and that's because they can't, they can't, like, if they're indentured, then they, they won't be recruited for the army. So like, it literally is uh, become a recruit and slave for the army or become a recruit and slave for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Those are your options as a Grisha, as a Grisha, yep. uh, even though they are treated well. And are considered most the most powerful people in the army. They get the good tents. They get their own like palace area, which is where a majority of the show takes place. Yeah, um, the little palace they're, is beautiful. They're fed. They're trained. They never go cold. Like, and, like there's a there is a scene. I think it's in episode one, uh, where Mal is talking to other like army people and, and there's a lot of like dislike of how Grisha are being treated because they're being treated so much better than the regular army people mm -hmm. uh, but then we have to remember like looking at the full story is that they don't get a choice to be there they have like no freedom yeah like <laughs> you don't get to be slaves. <laughs> you don't get to be a, a, a Grisha business owner in Ravka yeah right you don't get you don't get a choice you have to go work for the army and even though it's like it's a nice life and it's a nice career and you're treated very well it's a gilded cage like you still don't get a choice yeah and if you and if you argue or fight against it then you're locked up like mm -hmm. it is it is either submit or or be be gotten rid of mm -hmm. uh submit and, and die for us and this country that you are protecting but don't yeah. reap any of the rewards or are not seen as a positive influence in this country yep um so it's this idea of like the magic system is meant to marginalize these people uh which I think is very fascinating because they're all more powerful. <laughs> yeah, but see, this is the thing. Okay, so most, a lot of the times the the idea of like magic or powers making you marginalized 
is portrayed in a way that doesn't really make any sense. Like, okay, yes. in Harry Potter, magic making you marginal. Like, it's very strange the the dynamic between muggles and uh, and wizards in Harry Potter, and and how that comments and and what that's trying to say about bigotry. It doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, the the quintessential good example, of course, is is X Men. A lot of X Men stories really go into like powers making you marginalized, and this is another example where I think like the idea of powers and magic making you marginalized is actually done really well. I can see why. Because, okay, in, in certain political ideologies, you know, and I think I said this before on Harry Potter, like, but in certain political ideologies, um, there's this idea that your enemy is both insanely powerful and insanely weak. So when you have this idea of magic making you marginalized, that becomes true. And how do you deal with if that idea were true? Because in the real world, it's not, okay? In the real world, there is no cabal of people running the world it's literally just like if you have a lot of money that's that's all that there is it doesn't all the other stuff doesn't matter in the real world right but in this world it really is like part of what you were born with that magic that you were born with making you marginalized so how do you how do you deal with it when that that idea of your enemy both being incredibly powerful and incredibly weak becomes reality and i feel like the way that this show deals with it actually makes a lot of sense and is very interesting um the idea of like slavers coming and taking young Grisha and, and young talented people and making them into indentured makes a yeah. lot of sense. Get them when they're young. Well, it's, right? it's kind of like that. It's kind of like that idea of the, have you heard about how circuses used to train elephants? Yes, that's exactly what when it's they, like. Perfect. When they were, when they're baby elephants, they tie into a post and the post is too big for elephants to fight against. They can't push it down. They can't do anything. Right, because they're So little. elephants- Elephants learned that when they're standing next to the post, they can't move. As they grow up, they get bigger than the post and can take down the post. But circuses don't even need to tie elephants up anymore because they learned as a little child, as a little elephant, that if you you can't push past the post. Yep. So they assume they have no idea that they're getting bigger and that they're getting more powerful or that they could push down the post. They just assume that they can't push down the post. Yep. Uh, and and this is the same way is that you take them when they're 13 uh when they're tw uh, was it 11 in the books i want to say it was 11 i can't remember because they didn't say it in the it was show younger than I... 13 it was pre-pubescent yeah, yeah uh, so, so that's I, when they do we'll the grisha test 10 11 right? is when they yep. do the grisha test if you test positive you're taken away and you're basically taught that there's a strong force that is a post that you can never destroy even though you get more powerful and learn how to destroy them Mm -hmm. but they never do they never but they do. never do they can't because they've been brainwashed not to they've been trained and right. conditioned to think that they can and they live uh, in this beautiful gilded they live in this beautiful gilded yeah. cage why would they ever think that you know and they see they see and they're not stupid so the people in there see how others are being treated and when you're being abused but you're being taken care of while being abused you don't think of it as abuse right like at um, least my they might they probably think things like at least my belly is full you know at yeah. least i have a warm bed Right. And they're probably being told things like that too. Um, yeah. And so it makes sense absolutely how the magic makes you marginalized in the world. This is a successful way of making it realistic. Yeah. And so if you're, trying, real. if you're trying to do that, do it like this, not like it is yes. in Harry Potter. So, and I, <laughs> they do a great job in the TV show, but this is also written into the world. So mm -hmm. uh, it's awesome. Yep. But the show does a lot more. So the show expands on this idea yes. of exploring bigotry quite a lot. Um, and I know this was one of your favorite scenes, so I'll give you a chance to talk about it. But I want us to mention also that in the books, Alina is not Shu. Okay, in the books, she's just Ravkin. But in the show, she's supposed to be half Rad Ravkin, half Shu. And um, and and in in the way that they casted this, basically, she was um, she was kind of supposed to be like East Asia, right? So they casted yeah. a half Chinese, half white actress. So you can see that in her that she is different, and she is actually marginalized for her shoeness as well. And that's how she grows up. So she grows up marginalized not only by being an orphan, but by being Shu. And they show this in this really amazing way. Then in the scene, in a scene that I know you love. So I'll, I'll let you talk about that. No, and I think that that's something that I want to like that the and we'll talk about it in a second, or we'll talk about it now. Uh, that the cast is incredibly diverse. 
Yeah. Uh, Netflix, I think, did a real big job, good job of sitting there and being like, okay, how can we diversify this cast? Because uh, it's and a fantasy did, world, but. <laughs> absolutely. And they did an amazing job of not only mm-hmm. diversifying the class, but then continuing to have racism be a theme within it. Yep. Um, because it's it's really easy to sit there and be like, well, we have a diverse class, so we never need to bring up the idea of racism. And to False. be honest, if she had <laughs> been, like, they could have gotten away with shoe just being something completely different than half asian or yeah. or uh or eastern asian appearing they could have like they could have like never have brought it up and just still hired a uh american asian, asian actress mm-hmm. uh but they chose not to um and this amazing moment happens in episode six and that is Alina is getting ready for presentate for presenting her power in front of all like the generals and the and the important people and the king and queen, showing that she is powerful, showing that she can take down the fold. And her friend is doing her makeup and puts eyeshadow on her make on her hand. Uh, on blue her eyes. eyeshadow. And they're not blue eyeshadow, and they're not even having a conversation about the makeup. They're having a con- completely different conversation. But you see this moment of the woman examining what would be like the eyeshadow that she's wearing. Like that is obviously very in style for Ravkin people. That is like supposed to show that her status as a powerful woman, uh, of a general, of a favorite, of a a sun singer, like is supposed to show her, her off. But because she is half shoe and because she is of Asian descent, she has uh, hooded eyelash or eyelids which means that the makeup doesn't look the way it would have on a white actress. And they acknowledge that in the show, in the character, uh, and, and have her do her makeup a different way. And it's not even said. It's like a, it's a conversation that doesn't even happen. It's just an action that shows the thought process of this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it was a beaut- it was it was probably my top, it was just, it, as far as like understanding how this plays into the world and where we are in the world, it was it was an incredible scene. It's so uh, because good, again, right? they're not talking about it. Like it literally is just an acknowledgement of oh, this doesn't work for you because you're different, yeah. and it just it's the subtlety of it that really shows how much they cared about it. Because if they weren't keeping that in mind, if that wasn't a priority for them to show, that scene wouldn't have existed. They would have just put her in regular makeup that would have right. looked good with her face shape. Yeah, they would have just, she would have, the, the, um, Genya would have just done her makeup, right? Instead of just, instead of her doing the makeup the Ravkin way and then be like, mm, cause literally this is all she does. For y'all that haven't seen it, this is all she does. She does the makeup and then she basically just looks at it and goes, mm mm, and then just takes it off and redoes it. Yeah. They didn't have to and do it, that. It had nothing to do with what they were talking about. Nothing to do with it. They didn't mention it. It was never mentioned again. It just was this moment of recognizing, oh shit, you are, she is different in the world because of her heritage of being half shoe. Yep. And that shows the racism that is happening, not just the bigotry of magic, but the racism that is happening based on the races in the show. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And that being shoe is, is, a bad or different thing within the show yep because in reality there's not just one kind of marginalization there are many 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 kinds of marginalization and and they're here and i think that that's what makes this show outstanding is the care for that Mm -hmm. is the showing that it's 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 real and no one not no one but people might not have ever noticed if you're watching this and you're like oh shit I never really noticed that scene it was because that is the point but it's supposed to be there also for some people to pick up on yeah uh, it's embedded into this how world. racism yeah of how racism is embedded into not only our world but also their world <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and and that it, there are other ways that they show the bigotry in the show uh moments like that they're more they're more up front it's like no one will let her buy anything because when she's running when she's run to when alina has ran away uh no one will let her buy anything because of her heritage yeah like, they'd be like more, shoe, shoe money's not good here yeah there are more definitely like identity like 
racism throughout the entirety of the show so this isn't just its only thing but this is how subtle it gets yeah like they're they're willing um, to show the big the they're willing to show the the major and microaggressions and everything yeah. in between and i really appreciated that um because i think that that's how it would really be if this world existed yeah and and it's also like it's also a part of her identity which it sh- which like none of the other characters have even if they are people of color and it's because of the like i racism in that world so it's like yep. the in the the crows describe her as a half shoe when talking about how she looks that she's oh she's the half shoe one like nothing else nothing about tall slender anything like that it's she's half shoe uh and in the orphanage they they called her that as well uh, no one else was defined as that. Jasper is is uh, black, and no one ever called him black. Like it's, yeah, no it's one like says that. no one says the Zemini guy, even though he yeah. is. You know exactly. Katie, welcome, welcome, Hi! welcome. I'm so glad you could make it, even if it's towards the end. <laughs> we just got finished talking about bigotry as a theme, so you should definitely go rewatch that part once the mm-hmm. vod goes up. So let's get to uh, the next part, which is okay. So, I know, so Katie, so you we, arrived just in time. <laughs> we did. So we only have about 20 minutes left. So we're going to kind of rapid fire go through these, but we're yes. going to talk about the tropes that we noticed that were major parts of the show or that we thought were particularly interesting. And we're going to talk about, do we think they worked? So um, portrayal of strong women. Um, so I talked a little bit about uh, Alina being pants, and I just want to expand on that a little bit more. She is not defined. Like, she really doesn't have a lot of um, of character traits to her. The character trait that we see of her being kind of like, um, oh, I'm my own person. I'm going to do what I want. Most of the time when she goes and does what she wants, there's very little consequences to it. For example, she escapes the little palace, but she doesn't end up captured because of that. She just she just escapes and that's all that happens. Right. And it's part it because it's because she's pants. Right. But um, but that's just one example. This is supposed to be something female centric. And there's these three main female characters that are supposed to all be, quote unquote, strong women right nina inej and alina are all supposed to be strong women so yeah argue argue arguably oh wow my words are not working today anyway (laughs) uh if you break this down into a literary sense these are the three protagonists of each Mm storyline nina uh has an arc that is defined and well developed supposedly not really but it is supposed to she is the protagonist of that arc Alina has the protagonist of her arc. She is the POV. And Inej, even though the crows are a, are a team thing, we know the most about Inej and see the most change in her, as well as has the biggest antagonist, quote unquote, blocking her path, which makes her the protagonist of that arc. So mm-hmm. all three storylines have strong women as the protagonist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, strong mm -hmm. being in quotes so that's like an important thing that these are not just the women there these are the main characters if you broke this down in a literary sense yep yep um unfortunately though for me they don't (laughs) all work so they don't (laughs) no alina i feel like doesn't have like a good strong woman portrayal because because of her her pants um origins of being a, a 2010 ya character right um unfortunately nina doesn't get enough character development i know if she had a little more screen time i would love her but she didn't so i don't the only one i'm i really kind of think does it for the most part is inej and even and even so like she's part of a trio where you really are seeing all three characters equally the only reason that she's considered i would consider the protagonist of the crows part of the story is because she's the only one with a backstory right but they really get equal screen time they have they have an equal amount of of things that they do to help their plot along they um have an equal amount of cool character traits you know and the purpose of this the purpose of of taking this job and getting money was for her freedom Mm -hmm. to benefit Mm -hmm. her so even though jesper would obviously get money and and that was like also part of it too is that she is a protagonist too because this helps her development not only as a backstory but also going forward the reasoning is because of centric to her yes yes and jesper's just gonna gamble it away so who cares right (laughs) and and they've been new Um, and i think and i think it's interesting and i think it's interesting that even though this is clearly um a female-centric 
uh story that where's where's the other girls like every other female is very inconsequential except for these three right the yeah, other important characters have... are all men and there's so much more of them you have what is her name i'm terrible at names this is not the story They're which, which they one say are her you talking about zoya redhead no you're talking about jenya jenya so we do get a little bit of character development from jenya we do have zoya um but yeah for the most part it's it's mostly men <laughs> yeah and so then the men that get a lot of, of screen time and, and character development there's much there's more of them right we have kerrigan yeah. we have um kaz we have jesper and we have matthias right so and i just think yeah and mal oh my gosh i try to forget about him right but we've got like but of all the main characters so that means there's eight main characters and only three of them are women and no it's not a numbers game right like it's not a numbers game but but numbers who are we more who are we more drawn to who are our favorite characters does anybody have these three as their favorite character not as far as i can tell people either love kerrigan or they love kaz <laughs> people really like people do like inej i they have do. seen a lot they of do. pro inej I um too. i think i think other other also on top of this so a detriment that happens to alina's character is most of alina's development is talked about what a badass she is what a spitfire she is uh, and we spend more time talking about her Spitfire ways than we actually do seeing it. Mm -hmm. uh, she so she it's, saved it's Mal again, from bullies, but that's all in the past. Yeah, it's again, that's a, that 2010s YA, oh, she's a strong woman because she speaks her mind, but she stops speaking her mind the minute we start going into her mind. Yeah, like if she speaks her um, mind all the time, why does she not say anything about all the microaggressions she gets for being shoe? Like, why does it have to be when that woman is like, oh, I'd make her eyes less shoe? Like, why doesn't she say something if she's such a spitfire, you know? Yep. Or 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 just arguing back. Like, she's just taken. She just accepts things. Uh, she Hell, she just accepts when Kerrigan's mother tells her that Kerrigan is evil she just accepts it like she mm -hmm. does she she accepts it and runs but she doesn't do anything mm -hmm. her her actions are mostly inaction or passive action instead of this idea that she's a spitfire character yeah. who's full of who's willing to throw punches yep. like that's or her not, actions that's not written yeah, her actions like don't have a lot of consequences. So I'll give a good example of where she's like being a spitfire, but it doesn't matter, right? She begs Jenya to take her down to that carnival fair thing that they have, right? And the consequence of that is that she's seen by Jesper and now the crows know what she looks like, right? But do the crows ever actually capture her? No, they don't. So who cares that the crows found out what she looked like? It meant nothing. They were going to find out what she looked like soon anyway, whenever Inej and, uh, and Kaz watched the them do the display. So like, who cared that they knew a little bit early what she looked like? It was irrelevant. Or or the fact that like she snuck in, even with the crows again, she snuck into the trunk when she was running away. But yeah, they didn't, didn't catch her. Matter because did they that. didn't catch her. And also she then escaped. Within five mm -hmm. minutes of the next episode, she was on her own. So it was yep. like, it, it, it didn't matter. She isn't strong because she isn't a spit, or she isn't a spitfire. She really. isn't has her character has been described. We see no proof of that. Yeah. So did this uh, trope work? No, no not for me. Uh, also, very quickly, I know we're running out of time, but I just want to talk about Inej. Inej also has this moral compass of, I will not kill anybody. And the second one of her friends is uh, is hurt, she becomes a serial killer. Like, mm -hmm. it's just thrown to the wind and is never acknowledged. We see the actress because I think the actress really pushed to try to be seen that she was internally struggling with it. But there is no dialogue. There is no plot point. There is no arc backing up how she then feels after mm -hmm. she started killing people when she was very mm -hmm. much like, I will not kill anybody. Yeah, there's all this angst about whether she's going to kill the conductor or not because it's, you know, her religion versus her freedom and that's super interesting. And then after that happens, she's just like throwing knives wherever. It's like, it's cool. Yeah, whatever. like she she definitely saves like Kaz, which I am very grateful of as someone who was in love with Kaz. But <laughs> it, it is again, this like whole, it her strong morals are then questioned, which does not pertain to strong her being a strong woman. Or yep. her character at least being written as a strong woman because of those yep. morals that were integral to her character can just be erased. Yep. So no, didn't do that. Okay. So pain is power. 
So there's a couple uh, of ways that pain is power. So can you can we just reveal all of them and then real quick and then talk yeah. about it in general since we're running out of time? Okay, so a few ways that pain is power. Pain reveals Grisha powers. Pain is also how they develop Grisha powers. Like you have to go through pain to get powerful, period, for a Grisha. That is the only way to do it. So Alina becomes powerful when she loses Mal. So when she, when she realizes that Mal might die, that's when her powers are awakened that she apparently never knew about. I don't know about that. Don't really see how that's possible, but that's what happens. Also, the Black Heretic creates the fold when they when the soldiers threaten the people he's protecting, right? So he literally becomes more powerful whenever those that he feels like he's in charge of are threatened, right? So pain is power. That's the whole thing. And it's throughout. It is everywhere. It is everywhere in this show. Pain equals power, period. You don't get and powerful is- any other way. And this is a very common YA trope. If you look at it, like Harry has the same, it's his abuse, right? The, mm-hmm. the fact that he is abused makes him stronger. We mm-hmm. will continue to talk about this theme or trope uh, for the rest of this show. Probably, because <laughs> like, everything we like pretty much has this trope. <laughs> uh, it's this idea that you are stronger because you are broken. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's great to think about, but at the same time, like, it's just, it's, it's fascinating how it's written into different worlds, this idea. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's, it's a very it's comforting shown. thought. It's a very comforting thought, you know, because yeah. we all have pain in our past and we like to think that our pain makes us powerful, that it doesn't actually hurt us, right? It does. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a whole thing. So I think that this is, did they do this successfully? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, pain is power. Good job it's it's on this written one. many different ways, but then again, it's not creative. Yep, exactly, Katie, and... your comment, you're perfect. Okay, surprise villain. So we kind of already talked about this one, but real quick. Oh my God, Kerrigan's the Black Heretic. What? Um, oh, we talked about the consent, know. non-consent. Yeah, and then of course, um, we 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 see him. We see him killed by one of the Volcra. But then at the end, surprise, he crawls out of the fold, and he's not dead. He's alive. Oh, okay. Can I just make a plea? I understand that this was published in early 2010s. I understand that we've grown from this, but can I just make a plea that from now on, YA <laughs> novels cannot have that fucking trope. If you do not Show the see body. a body, they are not dead. <laughs> Show the body, okay? I don't care if it's been 10 years, if it's been 20 days, if it's been three minutes, if there is no body, they are not dead. <laughs> yeah. So like, okay, I don't, I think they actually did, did this, did, did that final scene decently, like as far as this goes, but I've just seen it so much on board of it. Cin- cinematically, it was beautiful. Oh, it was yeah. gorgeous. Like, like he, he crawls out of the me, fold. It, ha- it happened and they're like, oh, he's gone. And I was like, he, first of all, I know he's not gone because there's three, there's three more books. But second of all, no. <laughs> like Mal's a soldier. He should he, know that one hit well, doesn't also, do it all the time. He is the thing of darkness. He created the fold. Are you telling me that the thing of his creation is going to destroy him in such a way that it's just the creatures? I'm sorry, people, but no. <laughs> yeah, and that scene is beautiful. Like he crawls out of the, he crawls so out of the fold and he struggles to stand up and he like does this little this little look and he's like follow and i was like oh <laughs> okay so it was good it was, a moment. It was, it was good a, it was okay cinematic, it was a cinematic moment but yeah. it was the fact that they were so convinced he was dead like yeah. i i would have been like like even just sitting there and being like i'm not i don't trust it <laughs> like even yeah, like that nobody like, like he's nobody. gone like okay. but i don't trust it if if all it's like so here's the only change they would have had to make to make me not feel bored is cat if kaz would have been like y'all I don't think he's dead. He's been alive for hundreds of years. I don't think he's dead. I mean, Kaz is the one that's been skeptical of this thing the whole time. And now he finally does believe that the Sun Summoner exists. Why isn't this like new information changing his mind about how Shadow Summoners and Sun Summoners work? You know, and he's supposed to be the smart one. So he would have been the one (laughs) to say the line. Also, um, she knows she has to destroy the fold. So, like, I think that if she had also thought, also, they're fucking connected. I know at this point they're not physically connected, but they are. There is a connection and a bond there. And it it just, it's my least favorite trope to ever happen. The moment someone's like, there's no body, so the villain must be dead. I'm just like, lazy writing. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. How passionate I am. 
I yeah. will drink because of that. <laughs> Webs, thank you so much for the raid. I just want to let y'all know there's about 10 more minutes in the stream. Mm. So you came in right at the end. Hi! Uh, thank wow! you so much. Thank you for following. Um, wow, indeed. Oh my God. You guys are, they, I'm so they sorry. Heard me you lose missed the my whole fucking thing. mind. <laughs> I'm not normally yelling. That's not true. That's a lie. I'm no, that's not yelling. true. Well, on the media episodes, we definitely yell a lot. <laughs> There's so much yelling. Um, but yes, so this was something, it was a twist that like, I'm sorry, if you didn't see this coming, do you not watch TV? I don't understand. Like this was coming from a mile away. I oh, wish you don't they had either. Anything, but I love you either way. I wish that they had either committed <laughs> or not committed like, right like maybe I, that's maybe I, that's the beginning of season two but here's the thing is i probably when they were filming this they didn't know they were getting a season two but i would have loved yeah. that follow scene to be the beginning of season two like that would have made me that would have made oh, me more interested i meant more as far as him being a villain oh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the thing is is that like i wish they would have committed to this idea of really trying to not make him a villain uh, like stop dropping the hints stop making him this deep dark person you've already changed the novel so you can change it even a little bit more yeah like, like, like maybe, even maybe i love maybe him ben and alina Barnes. had a conversation and he actually oh, yeah. convinced her that wearing the necklace was a good idea maybe I that's love, the change i know? love ben barnes but give me a blonde because blondes are automatic automatically like set to to like not be dark and mysterious right so this is like, landon's preference disagree no, this but is <laughs> <laughs> no but no but it's like that whole it's all that tall dark and handsome thing right oh, the yeah. darker the darker uh reflection the dark or the darker face the darker hair it makes people look more villainous like there are there are actual like yeah, there's the a visual trope why. it's Unfortunate, that visual trope but so yes, I'm yes, sitting yes. here and being like, I love Ben Barnes. They shouldn't have casted anybody else. But if you're really going to try to sell the audience on that this man is not evil, which like I feel like they really were trying to hint at, but doing it lazily, then do it 110%. Mm -hmm. Like, don't call him the Darkling. <laughs> like, all of these things that I think just if you were going to that, do that, if you're not yeah. going to do that, then show the audience in the first episode that this guy is evil. Like, right, and then you're, and it's in. not a surprise for you, right? Then it's not a surprise for the audience. It's just Making a surprise a hundred, for the characters. I'm 110% okay with a reveal as far as like her not knowing he's evil. But mm -hmm. if you're not going to inform the audience of it, if you're going to try to lazily trick the audience, do it better exactly that's yeah my so it's topic. not it's not that this was it's a, so to me it's not that this was poorly done or that i disliked it or anything like that it's just that this sort of thing happens often enough that i thought it was a little bit boringly done like they could have spiced commit. it up with changing a certain other things commit or don't but yeah, either way yeah all right final thoughts okay Karen, final did thoughts this, did this resonate with you 110 percent <laughs> I loved this show. They made this show for Karen. Okay. I don't know necessarily. This is the Karen show. I don't know necessarily that everyone's going to love this show. Okay. But here's what I know. If you have read a lot of YA, okay. If you like the 2010 CW shows, if you are a de degenerate horny person on the internet, you will love this show because that's what I do. And they hit every single note for me. Okay, so if that sounds like you, this is the show for you. Even if that doesn't sound like you, there's a lot to like about this show. Okay, even if even I think if you're not like the demographic of of a of a thirty year old um, person that's way too online, right? Like even if that's not <laughs> you, um, <laughs> even if that's not you, I think you'll love the crows part. I think you'll love their plot because theirs is genuinely good oh, yeah. and I think appealing to a lot of people. So I watched this show with my husband and my parents and that's basically how they felt. Like my mom loved it. Okay. But my mom's crazy like I am. Um, but as far as like my dad and my husband, they thought like Jesper was the coolest thing since sliced bread and Kaz was amazing. Like that was basically their thoughts. So they really enjoyed the crows parts. Like their, their favorites, their favorites were basically um, Jasper, Kaz, and Inej in, in different orders, you know, different orders for, for dad versus, um, versus my husband, but that's what they liked. So I think that, uh, that, that there are, there is something in this show for everybody and considering that a lot of Netflix shows because they're pumping them out so fast are trash. I think this one is worth a watch. Even as I said, if you're not 
a 30 year old that's way too online like I am. <laughs> I definitely think if you like high fantasy, um, it's a great high fantasy different take, right? It's not the traditional, it's not like Game of Thrones high fantasy. It's a traditional fantasy genre. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, I think that, that it, it will resonate with you. Then if you like soapy romances, love triangles, then yeah, it'll resonate with you for that. If I, I really do think that they did a great job making it feel like a world. Yes. Uh, I want it to be a little bigger. Uh, I, I want it to really, if it's going to buy into the Game of Thrones, multiple sides, building the world, I want to see more than three storylines next next season. So then did it resonate uh, wanna... with you, do you think? Did it resonate with you? I enjoyed it. It's it's not my, I will probably not rewatch it. And it's, I will watch season two. It's not my top Netflix show. I enjoyed it for what it was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will watch it for Kaz. <laughs> Kaz, I mean, I kind of, the crows. I, I mean, in general, the crows really resonated oh, with me. Yeah. I'm probably more in line with your husband and your and your dad than anything else. Probably, yeah. And I, but I think you're right. Like, I want to know more about Shu and more about Zemini yeah. and more about all of these other I, places that are mentioned. I want it to be a little bit more adult, which is I, and I understand that that might just be where. Yeah, I'm it's probably at, not happening. As far as, <laughs> I know. But, but again, it's like that, you know, it's the difference between YA and like a world like this versus um, like Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm, I do, mm-hmm. I do really want this to build its world out. And I think it has the opportunity to do that. And I'm hoping because of the viral success and the amount that they really, that like that was a successful part of why this show went viral, but also why fans loved it, that they will mm-hmm. continue to do that. Like, I don't care. Like, it's not the romances that I want to be a little bit more adult. It is the world I want. I want yep. to, like, not be so hyper-focused on the romantic relationships. I want to have a little bit more insight into the political intrigue of the different countries. I want to, I want, that's what I want to grow up more than necessarily the romantic relationships. I'm down for Dark Lena. <laughs> I'm oh, down yeah. <laughs> for a, 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 a really messy love triangle. I'm here for it. Uh, I really, I do like that, but I do want to see the world built. I mean, I can agree with that because one of the things that I would have liked to see more of is like Zlatan's perspective, right? Like yeah. he's he's like um, the general on the other side of the fold that's that's trying to um, divide Ravka so that it becomes two countries and they secede from the other side of Ravka, right? And that's yeah. really interesting, but we really just get it mentioned. We don't really get it explored. Um, and I think that would a, be cool. If you gave me a story there, if you gave me a story... Uh, if from Shu, if you gave me, if you gave me any of that kind of stuff, like just a little bit more information, not all from the same side, I think it would be really cool because then it would not just be a show about romance. It would be a show about war and political movements, which with a little bit of cheesy romance in there is probably where I will resonate the most. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a little, a little bit more war for Landon. I wouldn't be opposed bit, to that. I'd be interested. A little bit more world. I just want to, I want to see all the sides. Yeah. I, I think again, it's that if you're going to, I feel like a lot of what they did both with Kerrigan and certain aspects of building this world, understandably so, because they were already doing a lot by combining several stories um but I feel like that they dipped their toe in the kiddie pool with that I want them to jump right in okay you're not wrong I think I just I think I just don't mind it as much you know what I mean I don't think you're wrong it's not bad (laughs) I would recommend it I'd be like yeah here watch Shadow and Bone if you really want like a fantasy love story Mm -hmm. yeah I think what Katie Katie's comment it really hits on it because it's not too intense or graphic or anything like that so if you need a break from that type of stuff but you're still interested in some some dark fantasy like it's it's good Yes, exactly, Katie. It leaves it leaves character building, and I want to see more yeah. characters here. There are so many. There's they've done an amazing care with building different characters that I want to see that grow too. Mm-hmm. So I think that there is a lot of potential for season two. I'm not mad about season one. I'm excited to see where season two goes, uh, but like it's it's an okay show for me. Understood. Yeah. Okay. So, do we want to close it out then? Final Let's slide. Close it out. Okay. All right. So where to find us? Um, You can find me right here on Twitch. I stream on Thursday evenings and I stream on Saturdays 
Saturday is um, Interstage Window, my show with Landon. And next week, we are going to be doing another community day. We're going to be doing Stardew Valley. So if you guys are interested in that, please join my Discord server and um, and get the farmer role. That's how you can actually play with me if you want to play Stardew with us. Um, and then on Thursday, we're going to be doing some more Final Fantasy X. So we're in the, the side quest part of that game right now. And of course, I have a YouTube channel. And here we go. Here's all my socials. Socials. Boom. I do everything the same way all other content creators do them. You guys know how that works. Patreon, subscribe to Twitch, yada, yada. You get it. Okay. Landon, where can they find you? Look at the thing. I did a Landon socials in the, ah! in the chat. You can find me on Instagram at Land in Maine. You can find me at TikTok at Land in Reverie. I do tarot readings there. Uh, my Twitter is always interesting. There's a lot of YouTube drama going on right now that I'm just liking tweets about. <laughs> uh, and I also have an Amazon wish list if you feel like contributing to that because I am redoing my office slowly but surely. There are update pics uh, on my Instagram if you want to see the cool ass stuff. Oh, and it looks so good, y'all. Colors. I have. I'm making potions for decor, and I need color requests. So go mm -hmm. follow me on there. <laughs> all right. So all of that being said, thank y'all so much for hanging out with us today. Really appreciate you guys. We're gonna go raid cucumber cow. Um, Ooh. so there we go. All right. Y'all go have fun. He's playing Kerbal Space Program. All right. And we will see y'all on Thursday or next week. All right. Bye y'all. Don't forget to make don't it forget, a great day. Don't forget to be awesome. Bye. Bye.